So Ross, start with a sort of 30,000 feet view. What is Ripple? Who are you? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I guess the easiest way to start is to start with um, the mission of the company. And the mission of the company is really straightforward, actually. So what we're trying to do is reduce the friction from cross-border payments. Um, the vision, the long-term vision, and like any good Silicon Valley company, you have to have a vision, um, is to enable what we call the Internet of Value. So to put that simply, it's to enable the world to move money as, as easily as we share information today. And a kind of nice segue into that is if you think about the way money moves today, it's inherently inefficient and there's lots of friction. And if you think it's slightly absurd, I think that you can kind of stream in the, you know, videos in the International Space Station, and yet for me to send money from here to a friend or family aboard, it can take anywhere up to two to three days, right? So we see a huge amount of inefficiency there, and that's kind of what we're trying to solve as a company. And how old is the company? Where are you based? Those sort of basic facts. Yeah, so we're a so Silicon Valley startup, so headquarters in San Francisco. We've now grown to have a number of offices now. Our largest international office where we look after our European customers is in London, so we have a big, big team there. But we also have offices in India, which is the largest retail remittance market in the world, uh, and in the Far East as well, so Singapore, uh, Japan, and Australia as well. And we've opened up offices in Brazil and soon to come Dubai as well. What's XRP? Yeah, so XRP is a uh, digital asset. So we make a market for a digital asset called XRP. And um, XRP actually came before the company Ripple. And there is a kind of line in the sand between XRP and the company Ripple. So I work for the company Ripple, and we are a software company, right? So we create software solutions that we sell to banks. And that's primarily uh, commercial banks and uh, payment service providers, MSBs. Um, and we believe our asset is very different from many others in the market because we're very passionate about one specific use case, which is cross-border payments. So we don't envisage a world where you can buy uh, coffee with XRP. We envisage a world where XRP is going to be used very, very specifically for the cross-border payment uh, challenge. And if you think about, and this is just more of a general statement on kind of blockchain companies and crypto companies as well, from my perspective, at least, kind of it seems as though lots of people are trying to tackle the world and trying to tackle lots of different challenges. Um, and when we speak to, so my job is I speak with many banks uh, across Europe, and they say, okay, this is interesting, but can, can we apply this technology to trade finance or, or this part of the business? And we, we say no, because actually the, the kind of success that we feel as though we've built over the last couple of years a big portion of that has been uh, because of focus, right? So we're very, very laser focused on one friction point, one challenge, which is cross-border payments. And, and why that? Why that one focus? Why did you pick that one? Yeah, I think just because we see, um, so the way payments work today is basically on, on SWIFT, which is the incumbent network, right? Um, and SWIFT, I think the, the first payment on SWIFT was in 1976. So if you think about the innovation on the internet, or of the internet, payments is really lagging behind that innovation. And actually, payments were never de designed to be uh, used on the internet, right? Mm. So, and what's also important is the customer expectations have changed in that time, right? So the innovations that we've seen the internet foster, so e-commerce, um, has changed the expectations of consumers. So today's consumers, well, I don't care what generation you're from, Y, Z, X, whatever, people want on-demand services now, right? So I got here today in an Uber, very simple. Um, you can order food on demand now. It's about a frictionless experience. Uh, and we believe today payments just doesn't have that kind of experience. So I, I, another thing is it, we kind of accept this paradigm, right? And I think it's slightly absurd that if I send money to my sister who lives in the USA, you know, when I submit that on my bank, and I bank with just a big UK bank, you don't actually receive a confirmation, right? Something as trivial as not receiving a confirmation that we all just accept as being mm -hmm. the way it works, right? 
you, you're told that the payment has been submitted, but then you kind of have to WhatsApp your sister or call them to, to but find out. So your, your customers are the banks who are enabling those transfers. You're not working with consumers. So those sort of customer experience issues are really the bank's problem, not yours. You're providing a back end, is that right? Exactly. So we're, we're enabling that experience. Yeah. yeah. Why would they not just do that themselves? Well, they can't because it's, le it's legacy infrastructure, right? So right. the infrastructure that is, exists today can't provide that experience. I think one of the things that analogy we use is um, if you think about emails, for example. So when emails first came about, you know, people could send emails to each other in the same network, but they couldn't cross networks, right? And what we're trying to do as a company is actually change the, the base layer or the kind of uh, the interoperability between our customers as well. So I think that's one of the differences between us, you know, um, and other fintech companies. You know, fintech companies are doing a great job uh, innovating further up the stack and building on the rails that we have today. What we're trying to do is completely change from the bottom up the way payments work. So, you know, we partner with fintech companies. They are our customers. Mm -hmm. If you were to do a Ripple payment with one of our banks today, you may never know that it's a Ripple payment. It depends on the bank that we're working with. Um, so I think your, your point is right, that we're trying to enable the banks to meet these expectations of the future, right? It's a very heavily regulated space, sending money across borders. Mm. How does that impact on you? Well, financial services is, you know, one of the most heavily regulated Sure, markets but even beyond world. that, because of, you know, worries about terrorism and the yeah. specific challenges of know your customer across borders and, you know, reg uh, it, not everyone is within the EU and harmonized and so on. So this mm. is a particularly difficult space. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, our role is to build this network, right? So yeah. our, our role is to enable our customers to have access to this software. Who they choose to connect to... They still have to do their own KYC is, and so is on. It's completely yeah. under their control. Yeah. And we wouldn't have it any, way, any other way, right? We wouldn't have a, a network which is just a private club, you know, and we're dictating who, who can connect to who. So banks are totally in control on that side. AML, KYC procedures, exactly the way they work today. They're just plugging into our infrastructure and, and, and settling over Ripple. Yeah. So you're dealing with big banks who have brand names that we all know for decades, and you're also dealing with challenger banks. Yeah, across the spectrum. Yeah. 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 So a couple of customers that we're working with. So Santander, great customer of ours. We, we love to talk about Santander. Yeah, so tell us how far that's gone. What yeah. is Santander doing with Ripple? Yeah, so Santander's a really great example. So Anna Bottin, the chairman of, of, of Santander, um, was kind of around her, her house one day and she saw her son playing with, uh, with this app and she kind of asked what this app was and it turned out to be TransferWise. And she found it kind of ridiculous that her grandfather had built this bank, Santander, which is a family-run bank, and yet her son was using you know, another system uh, to, create, to process these payments. So from day one, Santander's goal was to enhance the user experience. And that's what they've done. They've actually developed on top of our technology a, a, an app called OnePayFX. Uh, they've rolled that out across uh, Spain, UK, Poland, and Brazil. Uh, and we're working with them at the moment to expand into other geos as well. So, so their goal is to extend it across their network. So is that the use case that's furthest along for you guys, is Santander's? Santander is one that's quite, I would say, quite mature. We've been yep. working with them for a number of years now. But we're also working with SEB in Sweden. We just signed PNC, which is a super regional bank in the US, uh, amongst the one, uh, top 10 banks in the USA. We're working with a couple of banks in India um, to act as kind of gateways into India as well. We've signed over 12 banks in the Middle East now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the big differentiator with us is, is this is production um, deployments, right? So when I came, when I started at Ripple nearly two years ago, still had a lot of POC conversations, pilot conversations, and we took the view to not do any more. You know, we're not doing any more science experiments, we're not doing any more POCs. So every bank that we engage with now is on a commercial basis, uh, and our goal is to, is to move this to production. And if a bank doesn't, be if a bank doesn't really believe in that vision, yes. then they're not, the work, they're not the right customer to be working with, right? So, so what's the best metric for me to ask you about? Is it amount of money moved or amount of people who've done transfers or what? We see this as cu customer adoption, right? So right. What we're, we, we're now at over 100 customers, that's commercial banks and, and paying providers across and These the are people who are paying you good, cold, hard cash to do stuff for These them. are people that, you know, like any enterprise software company like Sof um, Oracle or, or Salesforce, these are people who are paying us license fees to yeah. license our software. Yeah. 
Um, so we look at it as customer adoption, and what we're, you know, intrinsically we are building this network, so we're seeing um, a point we believe that we need to reach before we, we kind of see the value of the network effect, right? Right, right. Where customers start adopting Ripple, but also the value of, of, the, of the software that we have implemented our customers, the value of that grows and grows as the network grows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, as well. So I remember when, um, like 10 or 15 years ago, really, when people started to worry first about, you know, terrorist financing and so on, and that was when people who have nothing to do with banking first heard of SWIFT. You know, it had been there since the 1970s, this thing that everyone had used, but of yeah. course, as customers, you don't see it. I mean, in a way, Ripple is going to be a bit like that, that people will use it but never see it. I think you're probably right uh, in terms of potentially not knowing if you're using Ripple. Yeah. So, so I think when you're building this, ubiquity is one of the main things. Right? What, would you so no, what would you notice, though, as a difference? If, if you, you know, it, as and when you've got those network effects up and going, yeah. and Ripple, you know, what would a customer see that might make them think, hmm, so this is different? Three clicks, 30 seconds, right. receive a confirmation that the end beneficiary has been paid, right? Right. So that is, so as easy as we can, you know, do a kind of voice chat or exchange emails, that's exactly how we want the payment experience to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, sorry, you, go on. I think Swift, Swift's a really interesting kind of example because, um, you know, Swift, if you think about, kind of crosses the line sometimes and plays a bit of a political role in terms of, um, you know, we don't see our customers' transactions. So yeah, our, our yeah. customers' transactions go over the internet. So Ripple could shut down as a business tomorrow, and our customers could still transact using our software. Right. Uh, the, same wouldn't be right. The, the same wouldn't be the case with, with Swift. Yeah, yeah. Who do you think your competitors are? Who else is looking for a slice of this market? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. I think many of you guys in the room will probably relate to this as you're starting up you know, businesses, and we just saw some great pitches earlier. You know, the biggest incumbent or biggest competitor I see is the status quo. Yeah. Right, it's going into a bank, um, Going, spending months with the bank, you know, doing workshops, telling them about technology, finding use cases, uh, understanding how you can implement the software, but then kind of saying that, you know, actually, we'll, we'll wait and see. Why would people wait and see? I mean, as you've said, cross-border payments is an absolute pain. Is it yeah. because they make decent money out of it, the banks? They do, and they, they yeah. can still, you know, we're not impacting their revenue model. In fact, we think if... They can choose their own. They can choose exactly. what to Exactly. So if you're, if you're, we're, lower, if we're lowering... Um, the kind of operational costs around payments, you know, they can decide to keep that themselves or lower the cost for their customers depending on the, the bank strategy or how competitive they want to be in, in a new and changing landscape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, th I think it does depend on the, the bank. I think, you know, where we've seen success is kind of, we call them challenger banks, but, you know, banks that have, um, I think, are competing with the top, with the top you know, the top number one in their bank. It's always, we're working a lot with customers that want to be there, I think, and change the way that payments work. I mean, what you describe is something that's a problem for consumers, I think, more than banks. I mean, I guess what you're trying to do is persuade them that they can offer a better customer experience and in the end that'll impact on what? Retention? So, so the customer experience is, I think, is one narrative yeah. that we focus on. I think it's most impactful for people like us in the room who, who deal with payments and are, are the customers of banks as well. But, you know, if you think about um, banks themselves, I mean, you know, global, global cross-border payments, failure rates are about 4 to 6%. Is that right? So it's not, that's not, that it's a non-trivial number. Um, and if you think about what banks do, the way that Swift works is it's this kind of fire and forget process, right? So Swift is essentially at its foundation and messaging system. It allows one bank to send a message or an instruction to another, but it does this store and forward or fire and forget process where you send off a message, and you don't actually kind of um, get information until they process that. So it's a so little bit like... Days and days later, you hear we didn't know who to give this money to. Exactly. It's a little bit like the analogy I use sometimes is kind of a relay race, right? So it's four people going around and passing on this baton to each yes. other. But, but obviously there can be risks and failures and people can drop the baton just as they can, you know, banks can deal with investigations. So, so we have people in our team that, you know, come from the banking world, that, that kind of client solutions directors that implement the software and their day-to-day -day job of working for some of the largest banks in the world. We're dealing with complaints from, you know, let's say Apple who said, you know, where's my payment? Or some big corporate customers mm. that are still following up because there is still a manual process, you know, um, involved here. So I think... 
I think the banks can benefit from that as well and, and provide something new to them. So you mentioned network effects. Is there a level of adoption that you have to see for this to really take off? Like, is there a tipping point for you guys? Is there a magic number? Yeah, is there a magic, I don't know, share of market or number of institutions yeah. or something? At which point everyone goes, oh, we need Ripple because everyone else has Ripple. Yeah, we, we've, thought, we've thought a lot about this, I think, and we talk about a, lot, a lot about this internally. So Swift as a, as a, has about 11,000 institutions. That's FIs and, and some yeah. corporates. So you have uh, corporate access as well. We're floating around the 150 mark, right? So we think if we can double the network size to around 300, 400, that's a good start, I think, to start seeing the network effect. So at the moment, you know, what I do and my team do is we work individually with banks, um, conversations that take you know, eight, eight months, a year. And if you've ever worked with a bank, it's hard for any banker to make a decision because actually in the, in the environment we live in, there's no one person that makes a decision at banks. It's a consensus-driven mm -hmm. um, process. And actually, the process does make the decision at some of these very large banks. So, it's going to take time, but we've, you know, we've, I think we've made some good success. We, uh, if you think about we, how long we've been doing this for, to have over 100 customers, mm -hmm. um, and we've got you know, 50 projects in play at the moment, getting more and more customers live. And, and um, people, those customers will keep using Swift and use you alongside? Yeah, it's a, that's, a good, that's a good point, and it's a question that comes up when we speak to any bank as well. So we're not saying get rid of Swift at okay. the moment. What we're saying is that you know, Ripple can certainly be uh, a complement, and, and fundamentally, it's a different product, and it can be used for a different use case. So where Swift is not very good, it's things like um, you know, high-volume, low-value payments, right? right? So I spent some time in the US. They have this kind of peer-to-peer -peer app called Venmo, which has just taken off. So you know, it's, it's kind of entered the lexicon in the USA, right? So you have a coffee with a friend, and they say, I'll Venmo you, and it might be $1.25 or whatever. Actually, coffee in San Francisco is about $5, more, yeah. so it'd be a bit more than that. But, um, you know, Swift isn't very good at those kind of payments. So what we're saying to banks is if you want to uh, capture the changing expectations, the changing demands of consumers, tap into high value, uh, sorry, high volume, low value payments. So we're talking about remittances here largely. This could be remittances, but if you think about corporates as well, the nature of their business is changing. If you think about someone like Uber who has... Um, you know, access to all these different markets and they need to pay, you know, an Indian Uber driver for a, you know, $5 trip, then I think, I think that's changing the way that e-commerce is evolving as well. I think we'll see a lot more kind of uh, lower value payments, which, which today's infrastructure deals with very poorly. So you mentioned some, uh, some markets that you've moved into, for example, Brazil. I mean, what's the strategy there? So, you know, you're not, you're not yet at the 300, 400 you see your network effect as being yeah. in your core markets, I guess. So why are you going? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Some of these kind of where we've expanded has been led by where our customers have, are. So we signed Itaú, which is the biggest yes. bank in Brazil, which kind of gave us uh, impetus to open up a business there. But when we think, look about places like uh, Brazil, India, the Philippines, you know, these are huge remittance markets, right? right? These, are, these are countries with huge populations and huge populations of working abroad as well. If you mm -hmm, think about the mm -hmm. Philippines and uh, mm -hmm. especially South Asia, so India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, there's, uh, you know, millions of migrant workers in the Middle East who are sending money back home, right? And they, they're being ripped off at the moment, the way they do that. So why do you not try and target consumers directly then? Because, I mean, you've just come back to the ripped off idea and that's what we're all kind of recognizing, but banks can just keep ripping us off. Yeah, so if we were to do that, we would have to be a financial institution of some right. kind. And yeah. with that comes a huge amount of uh, change to our business model and to, and to the way we deal with regulators as well. So we're very comfortable and we, we kind of want to focus on being a software company yeah. and providing this infrastructure. So I think we, we, we don't really want to process payments or provide a payment service. We want to uh, provide a software. But I service. guess you're there for your customers when they decide that the competitors mean they can no longer rip people off. I, I, yeah. <laughs> or something like that. You're right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we started off with this phrase, Internet of Value, and you told us what it meant, and then we kind of, you know, got really into the, you know, fascinating details of how your business model works. But let's broaden out again to that idea of Internet of Value. So what other um, elements of that. I mean, that you've just described as one, basically, which is the cross-border payments. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so payments is obviously somewhere we focus on. I think 
you know, the internet of value, what we see is kind of interoperability. So when you think about different payment networks, different blockchains, we still think that there's a lack of interoperability across these, across these networks that will expand and grow. Um, so we think interoperability is, is a kind of a key ethos of what we're trying to do. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's going to take some time to get there, but we are driven by this vision, and it's an exciting vision, right? So one of the things that we, we talked about recently is, you know, we talk about accepting these kind of paradigms. And one of the things that we talk about that I think we can all relate to is, uh, in the UK, we get paid once a month. Uh, in the US, they get paid twice a month. But we completely accept that. Right? Why can't we be paid every day? Why can't we be paid mm -hmm. once a week? Why can't we accrue on an hourly basis and be paid at the end of the day? And it's largely part to the way that payments are processed and the batch kind of legacy systems around that. I'm not saying we're going to do that next year or in 10 years' time, but it's, it's an example of how kind of we accept these paradigms and how they could be changed. I think the internet of value is, is a very overarching vision that we're trying to, trying to work towards. So tell me what I should look out for from Ripple in the next, let's say, 12 to 18 months to tell whether you're fulfilling your ambitions. Yeah, so um, hopefully lots of new and more customers yeah. going live and sending payments over Ripple. Um, if we, have, we have three products in our suite of solutions. Uh, they're really designed to solve two problems. So if you think about any cross-border payment today, um, to make, you know, fundamentally to make any cross-border, you need to be connected to a counterparty. So if I'm in Croatia and I want to send payments, if I'm a bank and I want to send payments to India, I need to somehow be connected to that, that beneficiary bank. But I also need to have liquidity with that beneficiary bank, so I need to have access to those, that currency. So our solutions are solving that connectivity problem with that kind of interoperability, and we call it in Interledger Protocol, which is the underlying protocol that we're creating. But we're also releasing uh, a solution called XRapid, and we've signed a number of customers that are moving into production on XRapid, which leverages XRP uh, as the bridging asset. So that kind of solves the liquidity problem. So banks have billions of dollars locked up in Nostro accounts with other correspondent banks around the world. We think something that's very exciting is kind of disrupting the whole correspondent banking model. Mm -hmm. which, by the way, has been around since 400 years until from the Medici flat family, right? So, so explain, just give people a sort of 30-second version mm. of what correspondent bank is. So correspondent banking, so one of the things that I think is really interesting about payments, many of you all know this, but, you know, pound never leaves the UK, right? Sterl, um, dollar never leaves um, the US, right? So when we talk about moving money, we're not moving any money. The money stays where it is. What changes is the accounts, right? So the correspondent relationship is a nostro vostro relationship. So if I'm HSBC and I want to transact with Bank of America, I have an account with that bank, which is debited and credited when, when customers, we all know this, right? So where we think XRP is really exciting is we call it on-demand liquidity. I personally think that that probably won't be adopted in those high volume currency corridors, let's say USD, GBP. But where the real sticking point is, if I'm in Nigeria and I want to send money to Mexico, for example, so today the only way that would work is I would have to bank with a bank in Nigeria. That bank would have to have either a direct correspondent relationship with a bank in Mexico, which if you think about how much payments are going to be going over that corridor, is that really, does that make economical sense? The way that typically would work is you would use a correspondent somewhere in Europe or, yeah, or North yeah. America. So what we're saying now and what we're saying in the future is we're giving banks, like the bank in Nigeria, a unique opportunity to enter a transaction where you're essentially swapping the local currency, Naira, into XRP. XRP is moving over the ledger in seconds uh, and, and settling in the local currency, Mexican peso, mm -hmm. right? So, so, we, so I think those are the two facets of what we're really changing is the connectivity between our customers, which ultimately leads to solving the liquidity problem as well. So that's kind of our goal. So just before I open things up to the audience, uh, I mentioned, and, and you, you, know, you agreed, that you're working with people right from sort of challenger banks up to very established institutions. And one of the things people say about the established institutions is you know, how incredibly ancient the software is and how, yeah. you know, how their back office is going to fall over soon. And the challenger banks have this opportunity to do things from scratch. How does that feel from where you are as a software company having to interact with them? I mean, does this, do you get sort of an insight into yeah. you know, where the banking industry is going? Really? Yeah, definitely. So it's funny. So you know, if you think about 
high street banks at the moment, the easiest way for them to innovate is by creating a whole new bank, yeah, yeah. which is kind of what's happened now. Yeah. So if you think about some of the banks in the UK, instead of changing the infrastructure, it's doing a spin-off startup, right? And we're seeing that at the moment. But the analogy I use is if you're working with a bank and asking them to change kind of systems, it's like changing the jet of an airplane when it's mid-flight, right? Because you know, they have to do business as usual and you have to make changes to the production environments, take time and, and inherently risk as well. So we understand all of those, um, those complications. But it, it is, I think if you, banks are ready, banks are receptive. You know, we have banks sponsoring this event today and we have banks doing their own FinTech uh, events all over the world. I mean, they're receptive to ideas and they, they, they understand they need to change and innovate. Um, but doing, actually doing it in practice is, is a challenge, right? And some banks are better at it than others. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess, you know, any advice I'd give to kind of a startup uh, is that, you know, be ruthless in your qualification and work with banks that want to partner with you. And if you find out very early that a bank is, is not, does not buy into your vision as a customer, then, you know, your, your time is better spent with, a, with someone else. Well, words to live by, I think, there. <laughs> um, I think we have some roving mics. Do I have any questions? Wait until a mic comes to you if you do. Hands up for, there's one here. Have I got a mic to hand to this bloke or has he got, yeah, there's one coming for you. In the second row here. Um, hi, uh, hey. so, so you mentioned uh, this example of the banking system being a, a So just hold the mic a bit oh, closer sorry, to you, we sorry. can't hear you. Uh, but one of the things that are, uh, kind of archaic that we kind of get, got used to, like um, there's no confirmation when you send out a payment, but it's, it's, it's actually much worse than that. Because like I can't send out a payment from my bank account to yours right now because it's like uh, 5 p.m. Like yeah. it's gonna go out tomorrow. There are bank holidays, on, uh, but if it's a weekend, you're not gonna get to, mo to till Monday. So <laughs> when is this gonna change? And uh, can Ripple, can XRP affect things so like that as well? Or is it, so, so it's even worse than you described, so yeah, can Ripple help with all that? Yeah, cut-off times, right, for sending payments. Yeah, it's, again, it's just Ooh. something that we totally accept, I think, and something that I think, you know, it's these kind of paradigms that I think all these people in the room are all trying to change. Um, yeah, no, I think you're totally right. Yeah, it can be frustrating. Yeah. Any more questions? Just, yeah, one here, lady here. Yeah, it's coming to you. Uh, I would like... I would like to go back to Swift messages. Yes. As you stated, an example from uh, Nicaragua to Mexico. Did I uh, forget the country? Uh, yeah, Nigeria, Nigeria, but anyway. Nigeria. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, there is more. There is possibly more than one correspondent bank mm. and several conto current banks That's accounts right. with we, uh, banks with, we, with which we have accounts. Mm. Could you explain your flow, considering there could be from. Uh, Nigeria to Mexico, there could be s six to seven MT-103 and MT-202 messages. Yeah. What is your flow? E exactly. So the kind of example I gave is the, is the kind of almost the happy path, right? If you're doing a direct swift connection or if, if it's just one correspondent, that's it's actually not too bad. You know, if you, you're right, you have multiple, multiple uh, hops. What, what we're doing is, you know, if you think about swift, it, it is uh, mess messaging. And where we're going beyond that is we're trying to, well, we are bringing settlement into the equation as well. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the first things to think about is that um, a, Ripple, a Ripple bank has to send a, a payment to another Ripple-enabled bank. So at the moment, both banks have to be Ripple-enabled. But when they are, we, what we've done is we've, we've introduced um, the best parts of distributed ledger technology. And we have essentially have, you know, the, the mechanics are fairly straightforward, actually. You have a si Ripple sub-ledger at the uh, sending bank and the Ripple sub-ledger at the beneficiary bank. And what we use is something called Interledger Protocol to actually synchronize the debits and credits in real time. Interledger Protocol, by the way, is open source technology. We want it to be adopted uh, worldwide. You know, you, there's interledger.org.com that you can, you can read about this stuff. So it's not owned by Ripple. Uh, and it goes back to that email example, SMTP and these protocols, we want them to be ubiquitous, we want some, them to be used. Um, so we're using technology that frankly wasn't there five or six years ago to enable the kind of settlement to occur in real time. So that's just between one, um, you know, sending bank and one, one bank, but if you extend that across the chain, if there are four or five hops, you still have that 
uh, atomic payments, so the debits and credits all happen together in, in real time. So there's no situation where you actually have a failed payment, right? Because the payment is binary, either happens or it doesn't. So very kind of different the way um, Swift works. So thanks. Well, that thanks was a great that. question because it really elicited an interesting answer. Thank you very much. So I think our time is up. And okay, yeah, thank good. Thank you very much, Ross. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you.